already. Hello. All right, so it's really funny because I just got the memo that everybody brought, brought the pads as soon as I saw everybody walking in. I said, all right, well, I'm cold and there's a fan going. And I think, is anybody else here kind of chilly? Maybe, no, no. But I'm gonna warm up, so I figured why don't we all do a little group warm up? Does that sound cool? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna literally do exactly what I do at home, nothing different. Um, and my whole spiel in drumming, and honestly life, but drumming, is I don't overcomplicate any of it. Have any of you guys seen any interviews or any of my like lesson videos or drumming stuff? Yeah? Yeah? All right, so you guys probably know that part, right? So same thing goes with the warm-up. So literally the first thing I do, singles, the most basic thing ever. And what I'll do is I'll pick literally the slowest, most boring tempo ever, get my feet going. You guys can join if you want, but literally what I do. And what I'll do is I'll do it for as much time as I feel comfortable. And I never, I never believed in the whole like, oh, four bars exactly, then four bars exactly, and then four bars now. So. And then what I'll do is when I'm, you know, in real life, I would, you know, if it was just me, I'd probably go for a little longer, watch a YouTube video and keep going. But for purposes of today, after that, uh, my favorite rudiment to warm up is the flam paradiddle. You guys all know that, everybody? And if not, raise your hand, we'll quickly... No? Every... Okay. Huh? Yeah. So, literally, right uh, flam. So I'll do right slow. So it's gonna be a right flam, a left, two rights. So basically a normal paradiddle with a flam to start that first right. And then it's gonna alternate. So a left flam, right, left, left. So repeating, it's... You guys can keep that going, but basically, you guys can keep going. So basically, the reason that I use this to warm up is does anybody notice what can potentially make this rudiment challenging compared to other rudiments, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So three hits in a row. So it's three notes per hand. And that, especially when I started, was like, wait, why is, you know, all these rudiments are like, Eh, level, like paddles, okay. Everything's kind of relatively, moderately challenging when you first learn it. This was always the one that got me. I was like, why? That was why. So I'll do flam paradiddles for a while. Flam accents. Which is a flam, left, right, then a left lamb, right left in triplets. So really slow, it's flam, left, right, left lamb, right, left. So a right lamb, left, right, left lamb, right, left. And really, if it was, you know, buzz by myself, I would honestly just repeat those, play paradiddles, play doubles. play rudiments forever around the drum set. And then once I'm warmed up, I play some drums to some songs. So, let's do that. And hopefully, it's not gonna be too loud, so watch that. And I, I'll try not to blow all your ears out. <laughs>
stick drop and all. All right, so that one with stick drop and all, yeah. which, see, it does happen, everybody, um, was called Flight of the Murder Hornet, and that was by Brady Watt. I play with Brady. Um, relatively new gig for me. Started playing with him through DJ Premier. We played the Paris Fashion Show in, uh, well, in Paris for Amiri um, in January, and then I branched off and joined Brady's side own group. And that was the first song he sent me, and I said, Oh wow, this is hard. <laughs> I said, this is gonna be complicated. He's like, yeah, you wanna learn it? And then we got like rehearsal in a week and we gotta play like 10 other songs. And I said, oh cool, what's the first show? And he says, oh, we're gonna headline the Blue Note in New York City. I said, oh, <laughs> cool. He's like, so yeah, you wanna learn them? I was like, do I want to or do I have to? Yeah. So he's like, um, So that one's really fun. And I love that one because I think it showcases the fact that he has influences in every genre, and we relate on that in many ways. Um, I started playing everything other than jazz, and it's funny because how many of you guys know me from my jazz-based playing? <laughs> See? So it's really funny to me because I played everything other than jazz. The jazz was the most recent, like, I'm gonna dig into this style for me, uh, the most recent, venture, uh, genre-wise, that I took. And it was a thing that got me the most attention, or whatever you want to call it. But I think there was something to be said for combining your influences. Combining that my first drum love and my number one to this day is Carter Beaufort of Dave Matthews Band. All, all day long, I don't care who's, you know, oh, that, not, no, no, number one will always be for me. Um, and the reason why is because he was really the first drummer I saw that I was like, okay, well, now I want to play drums and I want to do that. And the fact that he made me say that and think that leads to me, you know, keeping him as my number one through all these years. With that being said, I took all the influences from him and my rock playing from playing songs from Creed and all those rock bands from the early 2000s. And I said, well, I love listening to all this music. I said, but the jazz stuff is what's getting the most attraction, the most attention and the most you know, traction career wise. And I said, well, what can I do? I can either play jazz or I can not, or I could play everything. And I said, well, wait a minute. Why don't I play everything? And it's very interesting because I looked at my favorite rock drummers from the 60s and 70s, and there's a big, big pattern of all these rock drummers, Mitch Mitchell, Ginger Baker, all these drummers that said, I'm a jazz drummer, or I was a jazz drummer, or I learned jazz, and yada, yada. And I said, wait a minute. So all my favorite rock drummers, Michael Shreve included, uh, Phil Collins, all of those people, were influenced by jazz drummers. I said, wait a minute, why can't I do that? I can, I can do that. So with the next song I'm about to play, which will unfortunately shock all of you in a good way, shock you all awake, um, I found a way to somehow combine all of those influences into this next piece. So I'm not gonna even tell you what it is, just I hope it's not too loud, and I'll try not to play this one too loud, even though it's hard to play this one quiet. They know what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. Good move. Good move. Yeah.
It's hilarious. Wait. It's, it's really funny because I feel bad because I'm trying to play like... It's hard to do that, but I'm trying my best here. Um, so that was Psychovision by Suicide Tendencies. Um, <laughs> speaking of that. And I think that's a pretty interesting example because obviously just joined the band less than three weeks ago. Um, first gig is in less than a month. And going into that, it kind of brought me full circle into what I was just talking about, which is I realized, well, I'm going into a, a venture that is very, very thought of as heavy, thrash, punk, this, that, yada. And then, you know, listening to the music at first, I was like, whoa, okay, a little shocking. And my dad up there, say hi. <laughs> I played him the song, he's like, all right. <laughs> and my mom, who's on FaceTime over there. So everybody say hi to my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> she's going to kill me for that, too. Um, same with her. I played it for her, and she's like, all right, my son's doing this. Um, and then I said, wait a minute. The drummers who have played with them. There's another pattern here. Drummers who played all styles. And all my favorite drummers have played all different styles. And some of the drummers there have played everything from playing with Sting, a la Josh Freeze, to playing, you know, Avenged Sevenfold, Brooks Wackerman. And Brooks was a little older than me when he was in the band. And there was a certain cyclical thing that I, it seems to happen where the influences from one style carry over into another. And then there's something to be, something to be said for not kind of forgetting something from each stop that makes sense so for me it was yeah i'm doing all this thrash now but i don't want to throw out all my jazz stuff and going into it i said wait a minute do i need to learn all the fills like dave lombardo from slayer no do i need to play only jimmy degrasso's fills which are all just double bass craziness no i can play quote jazz fills because i don't really believe that there's such a thing as a jazz drummer a rock drummer i think we're all just drummers right can we agree on that one yeah, you play jazz or you play rock mainly, maybe, or you play everything kind of equally. But going into it, I kind of wanted to break that stigma of like, oh, you're a jazz drummer. Oh, oh, you play jazz. Oh, this person's a jazz drummer. This person's a rock drummer. This person's a metal drummer. Kind of just, okay, we're drummers and we're just going to play drums and we're going to enjoy drums. We're going to have fun with it. So with that being said, I'm going to have some fun with them now. And yeah, spiel over. Now, the last time I played this at a clinic, I asked if anybody, afterwards I asked if anybody recognized the song. So afterwards, please tell me if somebody recognizes the song. Because I was so disappointed in the fact that almost nobody did. And I was like, how could you not know this song? Especially us drummers. So now's a challenge. Now's a challenge in the room.
All right, so please tell me somebody recognized that song. Oh, thank you so much. Really? Wow. Huh? Somebody else? Wait. Oh, yeah, it's the two people. There we go. Yeah, I was very surprised. I was in Canada, and I said the exact same thing, and people looked at me like I had five heads. After I played, I was like, what song? Do you guys know that song? And they were like, no. I was like, what? That is uh, The Toad by Cream, Ginger Baker, after talking about Ginger Baker. It's one of my favorites. Um, and how many of you, so I, I think it would be interesting if we kind of split this thing up from playing and talking and playing and talking. How many of you came with a question regarding soloing? Did anybody come with a question regarding soloing? Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. I guess when it comes to soloing, I'm just at a loss, you know, option paralysis, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, what's your go-to rudiment for, uh, I guess, building the blueprint for a uh, soloing? Well, so the reason I said, did anybody come with a question for soloing is because I was about to go into a story of my own tips, and I caught myself because I realized it was the perfect opportunity to bring this up. So I was watching a video of Ginger Baker, an interview with him, and the interviewer was like, Ginger, how do you practice? Like, do you do you know, this and that? And very, they were asking very specific, do you play this rudiment and that and that? And he looks at the interview, he's like, I, I don't practice. <laughs> and I, I was just like, all right then. And he says, I just play solos. And I said to myself, at first I laughed. I was like, oh, he's just he's playing a joke. And then I said, wait a minute, maybe he's not. Maybe he's actually being serious, and that's actually how he learns, and that's how he gets better. So I came up with this idea, and I said, you know what, I'm going to do it myself. So I said, what I'm going to do, I kind of took what he said, and I spun it to myself. As I said, I'm at a loss. And I said, I have no clue what else to do. I play the same thing over and over again. I said, so why don't I try to come up with new ideas in any way possible? And I said, well, rudiments, OK. Everybody says, play rudiments on the drum set. Like that, that's like, like a go-to. I said, well, let me see. So I watched the video, the rest of the video, and Ginger basically plays a solo, and he keeps the same foot pattern going. And he messes up, and he stops. And I said, wait a minute. Now that he messed up, why don't I identify why I messed up and then learn that little chunk and say, wait a minute, it's like video games. <laughs> or you know, it's like that, that little chunk you break is now a little XP to level up. Or if you're building a house, that's another brick in the foundation. And if I do that enough, I'm going to come up with ideas. So I'll literally do that now, and I'll embarrass myself on purpose in front of all of you. Um, and it's cool because it's kind of like a cool, real process. So what I'll do is literally, I don't know, random foot pattern. All right, so right there, that was already kind of messy. So then I'm going to go back. I'm going to say, slow it down. Messy, slow that down. Now, I got that little tiny phrase down. which I'm literally just playing hurdas. Right, uh, right, left, right, left. But I'm orchestrating it here, and what's tripping me up is I'm hearing that sound of the tom. Same thing if you take any, give me, somebody give me a random rudiment. The most, yeah. Uh, switch triplets.
So when I first started, if I moved my hands around, playing on a snare drum was one. Very consistent sounding. If I move it. Mentally, for me at least, hearing that do 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 do, it, it trips me up. Yet, physically, it's fine. Does that make sense? Does that happen to all of you too? Yeah. So here, I'm listening to bub 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 on my left hand. And if I'm not trained to kind of ignore that, that snare drum's gonna mess me up. That's the melody you're hearing on the snare drum. So every rudiment has melodies on each hand. Now this concept brings me to a whole nother thing, which is the whole idea of recognizing patterns, which we can get to later. But I identified why I messed that little. And it's because of. Yeah, my right hand's going. See that? Same, same hard up. So you're, if, if, I don't know, your tom, if you're hitting your tom a little louder, per se, your brain might be like, what is that? And get you all out of time and all out of whack, and now you messed up. So what I did was literally stop. The opposite. So my left hand, that left hand melody was here. Now the left hand melody's here. So that messed me up again. Bless you, by the way. Like in all honestly, that one's still messing me up. It gets you. It gets you. All right, somebody give me another room. We can do that too. We can mess with. Paradiddle diddles. Paradiddle diddles. Yeah, that snare drum. If you're not careful. It's over. Number one, it doesn't sound so easy anymore. And number two, mentally, you're going to get a little screwed up. At least I do. So that is a long way to answer your question, which is basically I solo, like taking words from Mr. Ginger Baker himself. So I don't claim to invent that method at all, but I took his Maybe, maybe it was a joke, but I took it seriously and kind of made that idea into my own. Uh, and it works. Um, and there's different elements to it. So like that example was a, it wasn't so much a technique thing. That was more a, a mental thing I needed to break, right? There might be times where your technique is not up to your thoughts, meaning you can think what you want to execute, but you can't actually do it. That's a whole different thing. So if I'm here, I don't know. That's really like not clean. Well, that's not mental because I can think. I want to do. It. I know. I know. I can sing it. I can mentally process what I want to do. I just physically can't do it. So then that's a process of literally playing that exact same thing slower. is there. Right, one more person with a rudiment. Well, I 
Challenge done. That's one of the easier ones though. It's interesting. Yeah, that can get you, but. I see, it, there's, it's interesting because it, that, that's one of the ones that's very, um, because it doesn't alternate hands, you don't alternate, it's one side of rudiment. So it's a flam, right, right, left. I find the rudiments that alternate harder mentally when you switch hands on different surfaces around the drum set. Say a, uh, all right, go back to flam paradiddle. That you hear the I'm hearing So if you're not getting that So that kind of explains a little bit of the, the whole soloing thing. Let's do another question, shall we? Yeah. So you have some awesome hand speed. How did you get there? <laughs> <laughs> Which grip and just overall speed or is it fluidity? A little more specific if you can. Speed without the fluidity is no good, right? So I, I, I'm- True. I'm trying singles, doubles, trying to just increase BPM with metronome, doing the same thing with, with rudiments. Mm -hmm. I, 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 talk about your, your process of learning, because you're a young guy and mm -hmm. you're playing the shit out of these drums. <laughs> so so like, like give us a little history on how you got to where you're at. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, well, so I started when I was four, and I started very, 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 Acad you know, academically, if you will, uh, meaning drum books, very to the book, very page one, we're gonna do all page one, <laughs> page two, we're gonna do all page two, and then once we do page two, page three. Was it kind of the standards? Like very standard, syncopation, stick, stick control, control, all of that. And I got to a point, which I can't assume this is where you're at, but this is what my version of what you're saying is. I was now, maybe 10 or 12, and uh, I said, wow, there are these people, and it was on YouTube, and they were similar to my age. There was a few kids, and this one specific kid, and I remember watching him, and I said, he's so fast in his ride cymbal. He's like so like, twitchy and fast, and I was like, I wanna be fast like him, and he's like smooth, and what is he doing differently? Like, I'm not fast, I'm not smooth, yada, yada. What's wrong? I'm playing all my rudiments, I'm playing all this and that. And I remember I watched a video of Tom's Lang, and I realized, and this is for me, this might not work for any of you here, but this worked for me. I said, wow, great for them. Their wrists are really fast. Mine aren't. So I can either sit here and try to like all out, just muscle it, just, just wrist it and just wrist and wrist and wrist. And Like, I'm not getting faster because it's this tense and this, like, mm -hmm. But some people can be just with the wrists. I could never do that. So I said, well, I could either sit here and be like, oh, I'm not fast, and you know, I'll never be fast like them. You know, because that, that was technically, at that time, when I was learning, that was the proper way. 
there was, I wasn't exposed to playing with my fingers or push-pull or, I'm not even talking about traditional yet. Just, just learning match room, no, nothing other than. You played a rock beat with your wrist, played single. But I said, how are the people doing? I said, oh, my wrist is out. I said, no, Some, something's got to give, something has to change. And I realized, I said, well, my wrists suck naturally. They do. I don't know if it's a genetic thing. I don't know what it is. But I'm convinced that some people just, they, they are born with the ability to move their wrists really quick. I don't know. I'm not a doctor or whatever. But some people can literally wrist things out. Thomas Lang's a great example. That dude can wrist around the drum set and play. You know, just all over, crazy fast, with all wrist strokes. On his right something, he's like this. He's just twitching his wrists. Great. That wouldn't work for me. And a lot of people were like, oh, well, your technique of using yada yada is wrong. I said, well, I'm faster, so why is it wrong? <laughs> so I said, well, I am not going to just kind of give in. I'm going to make it work. So I watched a bunch of videos, tried all different things, tried the Dojo Mayer, tried the this, tried the that. None of it worked. None of it. The molar thing, the whole naming. Anybody go through the whole phase, or maybe you are now, or have been where it's, you're, you're very, um, you're trying to learn a technique, and it's a named technique, right? Yeah? Yes? Yeah. What, what are the, some of the names? Huh? Shank too. Yeah. Uh, French grip. Yeah, French. Bowler. Yeah, Bowler. yeah. So I said, so I said to myself, those, those are all great. <laughs> I said, those might work for some people. I said, I just want to play and I want to play fast and I don't care what it's called. I said, I'm gonna make it work. So literally, I said, well, I'm gonna start on my right hand. My fulcrum here. Between my thumb and my pointer. I said, wait a minute, that feels really physically easy. It's not a lot of exertion. Huh, wait a minute, I can use my fingers. <laughs> I can be like Carter Beaufort and go one day. So I said, wait a minute, now let me add in my middle. So I practice getting my middle faster. Then my, my uh, pinky, I mean, my ring. Just the ring finger and the, the pointer. And the thumb. And then just the pinky and the thumb, which I, I haven't practiced in a while. And I said, wait a minute. I'm going to add all the fingers in. Huh. That's a lot physically easier than. So. At that point, I kind of was in this phase of going, practicing a technique, and then a technique, and then a technique, meaning today I'm going to practice my molar. <laughs> today I'm going to practice my technique, and then my yada yada. You know, very like not mixing and matching. And I said, well, I was being taught, whether it was videos or books, that all these things are very separate, right? Kind of, if you go down one rabbit hole, you kind of, you should play everything molar, you should play everything thing. No, eh -eh. <laughs> I said, I'm going to find a way to somehow, wherever I am on the drum set, make a certain technique work, but I don't want to have to think about that. Meaning, I found that if I stop thinking so much, oh, when I'm on my snare drum, My fingers were kind of my primary force. My ride cymbal. It was fingers or it was push-pull. And all I'm doing here is literally just down, up, down, up with my fingers.
And then I tried to do the same thing on my toms. And I tried to do fingers. I said, oh, no, too weak. Because <laughs> they suck in the, they suck in the, the hit. Because it's so loose. I said, no. Nope. Like, that's hard. I said, well, what if I practice playing wrists? Here. And as contradictory as it sounds, in the beginning, purposely try to think about my technique so that one day I didn't have to. Meaning, in the very beginning of trying to combine all these techniques that we, we're, we're taught and we learn and we see, I said to myself, okay, one day, <laughs> I'm gonna play all my, my toms with my wrists and my, my fingers on my snare drum and on the high is gonna be finger technique and my, the cymbals, it's gonna kind of be a push ball. And I would literally practice trying to switch between them, meaning, Keeping a solid tempo. Now this right here, transition, it seems simple, but you're kind of having to let go when you're on your snare drum, right? Here, you tense up a little bit and use your wrist. Most of us don't think that we're kind of transitioning techniques when we're on the drum set, right? We kind of just do it, right? But I realized, well, certain techniques don't work on certain parts of that drum set. <laughs> so that's what happened. I said, I'm going to basically get each one relatively good and find what works best. For me, it was all fingers. Fingers were my go-to. I don't care that one's turned over and one's French. I really Does it matter? My left hand likes to be like this and my right likes to be like that. Is that technically wrong? By all like drum teachers probably, right? Everybody's gonna be like, oh, they need to be, who cares? Yeah, I can do them equal. I can purposely think and do both French and both. But I just let my hands do the work. Just let, just stop thinking. I said, I'm Doubles, okay, my hands happen to be turned over. Singles, my right seems to want to go more French. It doesn't really matter to me, though, that they're not equal. As long as they sound equal. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I really don't. I, don't, I just don't. As per literally just getting faster, are there certain rudiments that really bug you with your speed that you seem to be like, mm, I want to get that one down? Just, just like alternating flams without, like if I uh, flam taps, you yeah. do fast or, yeah. uh, but just alternating flams is screwy. Mm -hmm. For me, just when I play them automatically, my, my hands just use wrist strokes. That's one of those things where I, it feels like a very, uh, 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 uh. so if anything, I'm not that fast either. But then again, how often are you going to play? Bum, 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 bum. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Thank you. So that's a whole nother thing which we can talk about, um, which we discussed yesterday in our lesson. He knows that. <laughs> um, but that's an example where I was doing the same thing. I said to myself, oh, I'm going to beat myself up, you know, because you know, uh, I can't get this one thing. And I said, wait a minute, when am I ever going to do that? That. So a patty fla fla, it's called. 
So what that is, and that's kind of a interesting sounding one, obviously, it's a flam, right flam. So a right flam, left, right, left flam, right flam, left, right, left flam. It has those two flams next to each other. That is one time when, yeah, those, but as an example, I focused on playing that rudiment before I said, oh, I need to get my alternating flams down. Because I'm practicing the alternating flams by doing something else. So for me, it's about tricking myself. Because if I, if I don't trick myself, I'm going to get stressed out and I'm not going to want to play. And he does do some cool stuff with the pad of flop. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But for me, it was always like, I don't want to have to think, oh, I'm practicing X, right? That personally, I don't know about you guys, that stresses me out. It does. Um, I'll give you a great example. And I'm being brutally honest. The whole suicidal tendencies gig, I, for the like, first two days, I've had a little bit of like a, oh no, because I watched Dave Lombardo. You guys all know who Dave Lombardo is? Yeah? Play for Slayer? Yeah. Uh, I watched him play some of the playthroughs, and I said, oh boy. And my dad can attest to this, because we're in the car, and I said, I don't know if my double bass drum chops are up to there. Did I say that or did I not? He can attest to it. I said, I honestly do not know if I can play those parts. So I went downstairs for about 10 minutes, and I reverted back to old Grace, and I went bum 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 bum. I don't have a double pedal. I would do it over and over again. This is like this is kind of a long-winded lesson right here, but this is like probably the most important takeaway of this entire masterclass. Please, I went down there and I did that for about 10 minutes, and I said, "Stop. This is the one thing in the last year of doing these clinics you tell people not to do, and you're doing it yourself." Which is. I said, a, a long time ago, I, I had kind of an epiphany of, and this is kind of a, a, a concept that in the beginning is hard to understand. We discussed this yesterday, and I think you understood by the end of it, if I believe so. But um, it's really like my like, number one most important, I think, concept of like playing drums in general, honestly. And it goes really for any skill, and I know young, and a lot of people here are much older than me, so I don't come off as I know everything. That's not how it comes off. But I found in many skills over my very short life <laughs> that if I approach it one way versus another, there are two completely different outcomes, and they affect you mentally very differently. What I mean by that is this. With that example, I said to myself, Dave Lombardo's skill on his double bass drums is up here, okay? Okay, we can all agree on that. Mentally, I knew mine was more like here. And I'm not gonna be over here like, oh, I'm the greatest drummer ever, my skills are amazing. No, they were down here compared to his. So I said to myself, if I wanna be at Dave Lombardo's level, whatever that means, I can practice Dave Lombardo's hand speed, Dave Lombardo's independence, Dave Lombardo's fitness, Dave Lombardo's this, that, 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 and maybe in 20 years, I'll be as good as Dave Lombardo. And then I can play that Slayer song. That's the approach I had when I was young, and I think a lot of people get into that approach. Uh, I had a kind of a, I don't know, a, I had a sports analogy once, and I, it doesn't really make sense anymore, but it was the idea of I could get all my attributes up to this person's attributes that I wanted to be and take the long road. Or I could basically cheat and jump right to the goal. And what I meant by that is it started with, how many have seen me do some like Buddy Rich covers and things like that? Yeah. Okay. Dead? So basically, um, <laughs> I, in a very weird way, was getting annoyed when people were like, he's the greatest drummer ever. Nobody will ever be as fast. Nobody, and I said, mm-hmm, okay. And something clicked. I don't know why. Something clicked. I said, I'm going to just, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Don't, I, don't, I don't like the putting people on pedestals. I think we're all equal. I think we're all here. I don't like people put people on pedestals and, oh, nobody will be as good. Uh -uh, don't believe that. I said, so I'm going to try to, not try to prove everybody wrong, but prove myself right and say, no, I can play exactly like Buddy Rich. Now. What I meant by that is not, I'm as good as Buddy Rich. There's a big difference. 
yes, I can play this exact thing as clean or as fast with practice as this person. That's a very specific thing. Can you all agree? That's a very specific thing. I can do this task as good as this person. Doesn't mean I'm as good as a drummer overall in every skill set as that person, but that's not my goal. So I said, okay, the impossible drum solo. Everybody oogling, googling. I said, why? What is so incredible? Great, it's fast, it's cool, it's awesome. I'm gonna learn it. I said, I'm gonna learn it. And I said, I don't care if I have to do one note per five minutes. Literally, I could do. Okay, I could teach all of you that. And it might take a year, because you know why? We could literally go, wait five minutes. All right, next we're gonna do one here. Wait five minutes, here. And it takes two weeks to play that one phrase. But guess what, you're playing the phrase, aren't you? But what, you're playing it really slow. But you're playing exactly like Buddy Rich. Is that, is that kind of like, wait a minute? That's like a wait a minute moment, isn't it? Yeah? No? Everybody in this room can play just like everybody sitting next to each other and just like me and everybody up there. Everybody can play at a, the same stuff. They can. There's, there's no, like, that is unattainable. I don't believe that. that, that is, I, don't, I do not believe that. I think with practice and all of that, that is attainable. You're playing it. It might take five minutes per note, but you're still playing it. You just have to practice it to the point where it's cleaner and faster and getting it up to that level. So going back to my Dave Lombardo thing, instead of getting psyched out, I said, okay. Instead of getting my double bass drum chops up to being able to play War Ensemble by Slayer, you know, in 10 years, I'm gonna put War Ensemble at 50 speed and play that song at 50 speed. Half speed, I'm gonna play War Ensemble. Da -da 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 and the, you know, at 50 speed, the double bass is like, you know, it's like, it's still fast, but I'm like, all right, it's like a somewhat attainable right now. And technically I'm playing just like Dave Lombardo. Technically I am. You can't argue I'm not, I am. I'm playing the exact part because I'm playing the exact notes. I'm playing really slow and sloppy compared to him, but those are things we can work on. Doesn't mean it's impossible by any means. So then I went 55%, 60, 65%, 75%, 95%, and then I made a video at 100% speed, and I played War Ensemble. Now, does that mean my double bass drum chops overall are as good as Dave Lombardo's? No, but the task that I wanted to complete, I completed. You get what I'm saying? So I never believed in the whole, we're gonna dance around and, and kind of get our attributes as drummers, every, all your attributes as a drummer equally built up to one day be able to play what you want to play. If you love a song and you're like, oh, that's really hard, why don't you dive head first in, play it really, really slow, break that thing down and get it, because then guess what? You're doing it. It's not so impossible, it's not such a big thing, and I think if you attack it like that, it's a lot less intimidating, am I right? So do you now, like approach your practice sessions trying to perfect a song or mm -hmm. are you still working on some fundamentals as well and you try to mix and match those things? So my opinion of that was going back to before with the whole academic thing. So I, I was doing that and then I got to a roadblock. I said, I'm doing kind of building all my fundamentals, but the fundamental practice I'm doing with all respect to all the things I was learning, one day I said to myself, okay, this is something I'm never gonna use. <laughs> and I'm sure many of you can agree that there are books or videos. How many of you guys have learned drum stuff from books? Like patterns, whatever, right? Can we all agree that maybe, maybe, there's like one page in that book that you say takes like eight hours of your time to learn the one thing. And you're like, damn, that took so long, right? Yes, there's like one thing in each book, yeah. And then I said to myself, I did that enough, and I said to myself, okay, why am I, I don't wanna say wasting my time, why am I actually learning this? Yeah, I said, why am I learning this? And I'll tell you the, the story, because I was, I was playing a jazz gig. 
And I was doing this, and they're like, oh, we're gonna trade fours. And I said, oh, great. I'm gonna use phrase number four from page 16. It was over by the time I thought of that. And I ended up messing it up anyway, so it didn't matter. So I said, that, that, that day, that, that was at the Jazz Loft. That, that's a jazz club on Long Island, New York. That, that, guys, that one moment I said to myself, all right, everything I know about learning drums is over. <laughs> Seriously, I said, it's over. It's not working for me anymore. And I don't believe that's the way that everything should just, like, it's just cookie cutter. I don't, I, no. <laughs> now, fundamentals are so important because I would never be where I am without learning my rudiments, good technique, good posture, learning the basic grooves, learning, you know, some Latin, some jazz, some rock, like all of that stuff, yes, yes, yes. Learning the fundamentals, yes. But then, eventually, the fundamentals start to blur into a line of rainy day material, as I call it, of like rainy Saturday, two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm bored, and I'm gonna spend nine hours learning some polyrhythm that I will never play. <laughs> See, you're laughing because you, know, you all know what I'm talking about. And I started doing that. I was like, all right, Cool. Oh, crap. Now, I'm not judging if that's a groove. Like, if that's something that you're working on, you're, you're, you know, you're starting out, that's how I still do things. What I was trying to demonstrate is that's something like, I don't know, I'm trying to give you an example of if that was something in some crazy time signature, right? That's what I'm trying to say. If it's some groove in some like 19 over this poly, yeah. Because the, the fundamentals that people start to teach and you see are not so fundamental, I believe. I think the fundamentals are really, really simple. And they're not as broad as people make them out to be. I think there is a, like, kind of an end, honestly, where this, these sets of things you need to learn, get all of those as good as you can get, and then you start to branch out and be more specific with your drumming. The reason I thought of that was I said, OK, all of my favorite drummers, all of them, every single drummer in this room, what is the most amount of notes we play per limb consecutively, if that makes sense? Most of the time, I'm not talking about like metal where you're just going like, you know, it's just like forever. Honestly, like watch Buddy Rich, who, who are people's favorite drummers? Just name them, just like favorite drummers. Stuart Copeland. Stuart, people love, huh? Tony Williams. Great. Harry Thomas Lang. Yeah, great. Exactly. So all of these drummers, what, honestly is the most amount of notes they probably typically play per hand at a time? Uh, even simple, even a simpler answer. Like in a bar. You're, we're basically all just playing a combination of singles and doubles around the drum set on our hands and feet, right? All the stuff I've been playing the past whatever hour, that's just, what, singles and doubles. Maybe three, wow, three notes per hand really branching out there. But I'm trying to break it down, it's not complicated. It's not complicated. So I said to myself, all my favorite drummers, all these guys, I said, wait a minute. They are really good at really basic things. Instead of the approach of, I kind of skipped out on learning the really basic things, and I jumped into learning the really complicated things, and now somebody asked me to play a single stroke role and it's messy. I said to myself, I would rather be able to play a single stroke roll as clean as ever, and a double paradiddle, and a paradiddle, and all, and a basic rock groove, and never, never be able to play some 19 over this, that, that fundamental groove that is not so fundamental. So my approach was, I need to simplify it, because all these drummers, like Stuart is a perfect example. We love his playing, because he's so energetic, and he has these cool drum parts, but none of it is technically complex, right? It's technically very simple if you break it down, right? That's what? all that kind of stuff. All these drummers have one thing in common, which is it seems like all of their fundamentals were really damn good. 
So I said to myself, all my favorite drummers, Sonny Payne, Carter, all those people, they're really good at really basic things, and all of their solos and part writing is based around really simple stuff. Was Buddy Rich playing like a polyrhythmic thing on his foot, and then uh, an ostinato on his left hand that fluctuates between six and nine? And no. What was he playing? He's playing singles and doubles, really fast and really clean, like just around, right? Yet everybody thinks he's the greatest. So I was like, wait a minute. It's all an illusion what we're doing. We just got to be really good at really basic things, and we crack the code. So to answer your question, I said to myself, I'm going to get my fundamentals of some rudiments, singles, doubles, paradiddles, physical like fitness of moving around the drum set, and motion, really good. My hand technique, really good. And then at a certain point, I'm going to maintain and grow that. But I don't find my time worth diving into some weird, crazy polyrhythmic thing when I have songs to learn. Or not have to, for some of you, want to. Honestly, want to. There are songs, I don't know, you want to learn a Brand X song, you want to learn a Phil Collins song, whatever it is. Those songs, this, that, or whatever. Learn them for fun and have fun with it. If, because aren't we all trying to have fun? Instead of I'm going to just, oh, I can't get this groove that's in like 19 over whatever. No. Like, that's like kind of useless. For like, unless it's one song that has some weird time signature which you're being maybe asked to learn or paid to learn. That's a different circumstance. In my case with the suicidal stuff, yeah, I am very task oriented. I'm very laser focused on I'm going to learn this song, but mentally, I had to shift. Because I think this whole drumming thing is all mental. It's all mental. Physically, great. But you can all break it down to mental. Uh, mental of, oh, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to practice. I'm going to have the dedication to practice. And the mental thought of how I'm going to approach it. Because it's an intimidating thing. Especially, I think, um, Watching it, especially the way you guys are watching it, versus when you're doing it, can't you agree? Something, something about watching somebody do something and they're doing it yourself, at least on the drums for me. I literally went to the last suicidal show with Brandon on drums, and I'm watching him. I'm like, I'm not going to be able to do this. And my brain just went to that. I was like, uh oh, uh oh. But then I played the songs. I was like, oh, they're not that bad. Yeah. Um, have you had? The ergonomics of a setup. Mm. Did, have you had to spend a lot of time thinking about where where things go? You know? Well, when I was really young, I got into a phase where, God forbid, you touched this crash and moved it. Oh no! <laughs> that, that that was me too. Okay, I'll tell you a really funny story. So my very 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 good friend Billy Reimer. You guys know who he is? Drummer for Dillinger Escape Plan. Yeah. Very, very close friends. He came over and he said, he comes and I sit to my drums, he goes, and he's like, oh, he said, that bass was way too tight. And I was like, I was like, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Um, you. I'm 12. I was 12. I was, yeah, I was probably like 12, 13, right? I was your age. I was literally basically where you are, too. Guys, he takes my floor tom and he goes, oh, that's right, that's what I did. Throws the bass drum this way and starts unloosening the tension rods, I nearly had a panic attack. <laughs> I was like, I'm never going to be able to put it back the way it's supposed to be. I can't play. Uh, uh, it's going to take me hours. It's going to take me days to make it right again. Like, the angles, like, it, it's got to be perfect. This and that. It's got to be, it's got to be where it's got to be. Guys, he unloosens it. He puts it back. He doesn't even clamp the bass drum pedal onto the bass drum. <laughs> puts the floor tom, like, I had one floor tom, so like here. This wouldn't even be here. Guys, he ripped the craziest solo on it, which I thought to myself, oh, I'll never be able to play that. It was that good. And that moment taught me a big lesson, which was, in the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. But that, that, the, there, there is a dichotomy. There is, there is a balance. It doesn't matter in the short term of like if you're in a gig and the crash moves. I had to learn of like, if I'm in a gig situation, I'm sitting on somebody else's drum set, I don't have the luxury of doing that. I sat in on a gig uh, at the 
Paramount in New York a few weeks ago. And my friend, he sits like on the floor, basically. He's one of these people who sits with his like, legs like this. I'm happy he can do that. I cannot. But I was not going to go to his drum set and be like, wait, crowd of thousands. I'm about to sit in. Let me raise the seat. No, I sat down. Yeah, I was uncomfortable. But out of forcing myself, I said, I need to just learn to be able to just adapt. <coughs> now, that being said, if I have the luxury, it's not so much about like perfect, but I think there is something to be said for making it comfortable in the way of, for me, it was, I had to learn how to, um, over gigs and, and, and playing in my you know, basement and playing wherever, playing different sized drum sets, what is most comfortable? And I had to be really brutally honest and not care what other people thought. People have sat on my, actually it was just a uh, week and a half ago, I was at Drumeo. You guys all know what Drumeo is? Yes. I was up at Drumeo filming um, and I sat down and the, I, I'd already set the whole kit up and somebody, uh, one of my friends sits down and she's like, you sit with your feet so wide. And like, it, like, it's like, and I was like, I don't even notice it. That's just how it works for me with my body. Now, this might be why for somebody. I have no clue. There's no right or wrong. I honestly believe you've got to make it for you. You've got to make that thing work. There are some drummers who need to get extensions and this. Great, do it. But I think um, really the ergonomics of like, oh, I don't want to get hurt too. Because a lot of people are like, well, how do I make, a lot of people ask me, how do you make your drum set most efficient, right? Uh, number one is comfort of space. Like for me, I can't have everything tight. I can't, I, I can't do it. Because I start to get like <laughs> drum claustrophobic where I feel like I'm gonna hit every cymbal if I hit a tom or I'm gonna hit this if I, it's too close. But then I'm gonna contradict myself big time right now. Get suicidal gig. Practice with my drum set really with the cymbals wide apart. And this was literally a week ago. I was in my basement and I said, all right, I just, leveled up mentally as a drummer myself because I learned something about myself. I'm exhausting myself. I'm exhausting myself with this music. So no, in that case, honestly, it's not set up like this. The ride is way closer. The cymbals are closer because I don't have the time to go in suicidal. All the grooves are. And just that little, if it's further, I'm getting tired. I'm getting really tired. All the, the rides and stuff, I can't be doing it out here. It has to be here. It's about, the, I think it's very situational. Now, if you're playing music you're really comfortable with and you're really like, you're, you know, like right now, me, I'm able to play the suicide songs because I'm playing like one or two and I'm like having fun and yada, yada so I can kind of keep my, this is like my average drum set. If I'm specifically doing that one thing, uh, I'll set it up for that one thing but then it actually makes it uncomfortable to then play a, j a big solo on that drum set. Like the, the way I'm setting up my suicidal kit, yeah, I can solo on it, but it's not nearly as comfortable a solo on as this one because it's tight. I'm kind of worried I'm gonna hit something, but I'm also not doing certain movements in that, that situation. I'm not doing any crossovers. <laughs> I'm not playing traditional grip. Um, I'm not doing anything under the crash. The crash is way lower. It's just, it's about speed. So I think honestly, to answer your question, it's about what you, what's your main goal. If your main goal is comfort, comfort. If your main goal is in my case, a, a job, literally, like a task, I had to make it work for that task. Now, am I, am I really comfortable? Ah, not really, to be honest with you, but I had to make myself comfortable with it. Yeah. Oh, I was wondering how you meet so many people and get so many connections. Like I Usually when I go to sit-ins, I try to meet every musician and compliment them, but how do you like, know like, the most, like, just everyone? It's just, it's odd. I don't know how you meet so many people and form a strong bond. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I'll be really honest with you. I think you need to be the most genuine you possible. And in the nicest way possible, you don't need to go up and compliment everybody. Okay. You don't. That is being honest. Now, if you're in your heart believing that you, you want to compliment them, compliment them. But don't, if I were you, I would not go, and personally, I wouldn't,
go to compliment them just to compliment them, just to get a connection, just to be kind of artificial about it. Because the biggest thing is who you are as a person. And especially in this industry, I was just describing this to somebody. I was saying, you know, we don't really get, as drummers, especially if you're doing it for your profession, uh, you're not getting paid in my mind to play the drums. I'm not getting paid to play those songs. I'm getting paid to be away from my family, be on the road, be with other people, live a different lifestyle. That's what you're really getting paid for, if that makes sense. Your time, things like that. And the reason I'm bringing that whole pay thing up, and it, even if you're not doing this profession, it's about you as a person, because people don't honestly want to be around people. You could be the greatest drummer ever, and if you're a jerk, <laughs> and you're, you're hard to be around, or you're this or that. <laughs> so honestly, I just, I be me. I don't try to impress anybody. I don't try to like schmooze up to people. I just try to, I play the drums, I have fun. Um, and I think people are attracted to you being you. Um, I think people are attracted to realizing that you're a real person and not just a really good drummer, you know? Um, so I think just like in any, any other circle, you know, if you're in, uh, I don't know, when I was in high school, if I wanted to make friends, I wouldn't just like go up to random people and compliment them to hope they're my friends. I would just be like cool and nice and just like, hi, how are you? <laughs> like, I don't know, like just be nice to people and hope friends came out of that. I made friends yesterday here, but it's not because I was like, Oh, like, I'm such a good drummer, like, you know, you're, you know, like, let's be friends. It was like, hey, this is my interest outside of drums. This is me. This is, I'm a person. Let's be friends. So honestly, my biggest excuse is be real. Um, the social media thing, be real too. If you, if do you do try to post on social media and get it through there too? So connections through there? Yeah? Yeah. Um, on that front, I would say be, find something unique and different. Find something that nobody else is doing. Find a, a, a hole to fill. Because honestly, it's, it's tough to kind of just do what everybody else is doing sometimes. You, you want to somehow find a way to do something fresh. Because if everybody starts doing the same thing on the drums, it's going to be like any other art or thing that has ever died out. It's just going to die. Because nothing's going to be invented. Nothing's going to be fun. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, we're trying to have fun, right? So I would say be real, have fun with it, and just focus, focus on being the best you and the best drummer and the best person, and the connections will come. Don't focus on the connections and then, I also am gonna practice drums. Yeah. I would focus on practicing drums and being validated in yourself and on, uh, on the drum set and your, your skills and that, and then people will wanna come to you. That's what happened to me, I said, yeah, there was a point where I wanted to seek out people. And then I was seeking out people and I was getting nowhere. And I got very frustrated. And again, father can attest to that. I was trying to seek out gigs, seek out things. And I said, uh-uh, nope, I don't need nobody. Now, that attitude is very a harsh way of saying it. But in my mind, I said, if I mentally can go through this with the attitude of I don't need anybody, but I'm very nice about it and humble about it, people will want to come to me because I'm being me, right? Does that make sense? I, I had to become secure in the fact that I don't need nobody. I will practice, I will be good, I will work hard, <laughs> and I will run and go to the gym and be by myself, and the connections and the work and the friends will come. So that's your, that's your answer. So from, from what I'm understanding, you're just like, what I think what you're telling me is just be your genuine self, yeah. find your path in life and just follow follow it and just, just be, you know. Exactly, exactly. And then the rest will fall into place. The rest will fall into, and, and honestly, that's the exact same thing I was just talking about the music and the, 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 the technique thing, because it's like, I learned all the songs and the technique fell into place. Does that make sense? I learned the Slayer song and the double bass drum technique fell into place for me. Instead of, I'm gonna get my double bass drum chops really good and then play the Slayer song, no. I'm going to play the Slayer song and my double bass drum chops will get there. Yeah. Thank you. 
So I, I've got a question, Grayson. Yeah. You as a 20-year-old man, nailing Buddy Rich, nailing the Don Lombardo, nailing everything that you're touching, you're in a very unique position to say, hey, I can start guiding this music thing. You just said it a second ago. If everybody learns the same thing, it all becomes boring. Mm -hmm. As a 20-year-old, I mean, have you thought about where you want to take this whole music thing? I mean, you're in a crazy position to lead an industry, to lead a lot of stuff. Are you thinking about that? What um, do do well, honestly, I, I, in the beginning, I didn't. And it sort of... It's interesting because it didn't ha it, it wasn't like this planned out sort of I'm going to some people are able to plan these things out mentally. They're they're the type of person who can I'm going to strategically do this and I'm going to no. For me that strategy was I uh, again, I'm going to be the best me. And the whole the whole becoming whatever you want to call it in the industry and I, whatever it is a a figure, which I even hate saying that because I hate talking about myself like that. That snuck up on me. That was not the goal. The goal was, I'm in my basement. <laughs> I'm going to be the best I can be. And I'm going to work harder than anybody else. And I was about to say unfortunately, but it's, it's, it's very hard to say unfortunately. But there's good and bad sides when it comes to that, about the whole um, thing of you are now a, a thing, right? Because that wasn't my goal. So I don't think I was necessarily prepared for it either, in a way. Because then here I am with all these people looking at me like, oh my god. And I'm over here like, what am I doing that's so special? Genuinely. And that's not me being, you know, facetious, what is the word, facetious or whatever, you know, and trying to like play a game. No. I'm like, what's so special? I'm working hard. And then I realized, I said, well, maybe there is something that people like genuinely are interested in. And if anything, it was the musically. So that was, that was personally, mentally, that was the, the, the struggle. Um, musically, drumming wise, it was really, I looked up to these drummers who did not, <laughs> didn't care what people thought. They broke the mold. And that's what I wanted to do. Because I, I watched Sonny Payne. There was the videos of Sonny Payne. You guys all know who Sonny Payne is? Jazz drummer, if you don't look him up, amazing, amazing. But he would be playing with Count Basie or, or Frank Sinatra, jumping around on the drums, going crazy, doing tricks and all stuff. And I said, he is so out of place in the best way possible. But guess what? Me, I, I don't know how old I was, thought that was really cool and thought that was attractive. And I said to myself, well, if I do my own version of that, maybe, just maybe, one day, a kid just like me, because I'm no different than anybody else, will look up to me like I looked up to him, if that makes sense. Because I don't honestly think in his mind, and I, obviously I can't assume, he was thinking, I'm going to change drumming, I'm gonna, but it just happened. Same with Buddy Rich. I don't know if he had the attitude of, I'm going to go change drumming. But he broke the mold and he was like, I'm going to do what I believe in and what I want to do. And then it became something. So it wasn't necessarily the focus, but now it kind of has to be because it's almost like a responsibility because people are looking up to you like, well, what are you going to do with it? What do you, and it's like, it's like, oh my God, it's like I have to actually think about the answer because like it's so far out of my mind because I don't view myself that way, which is tough because it's like almost like an imposter syndrome thing where I don't view myself that way at all. I still view myself as like the kid in my basement working hard who honestly nobody cared about <laughs> drumming wise, not like family wise, I'm saying, you know, drumming wise, because I, I got like, you know, d denied from music schools for college and, and like put down in many drumming ways. And I said to myself, I'm just going to prove everybody wrong and have that attitude. And I never really lost that. So now being thrust into the spot of like, well, where are you going to take it? Because you're like an authority. It's like, I'm an authority? What do you mean? <laughs> but if anything, it's that same attitude of I just wanted to break the mold and, and combine jazz and rock and all the styles and bring back the entertain, entertainment aspect. Because going back to Sonny and all those guys, it was, it was a show. It wasn't just about I can play in the pocket in the group. And that's all great. But that's great when you're playing with the specific role. 
but people were going to see Count Basie with Sonny Payne on drums because Sonny Payne was incredible and he was an entertainer. So if anything, I wanted to bring back the entertainment aspect of it. So yeah, yeah. With that being said, like, um, like your tricks, like you know when you and you're grabbing, you know, the hi hat. Yeah. What What are you doing when you're doing that? Like, it, are you making the hi hat sound me different? Like, or? just grabbing it. Well, that that whole thing came about because what you can do is, I never really believed it, but people were like, you can keep your hi hats semi closed, and it's easier to control them. My foot doesn't have to move because it's my foot would be going and like. That's harder to do. Right. That's nothing like, you know, I think that was out of necessity of back in the day, they didn't want to like, the, I'm sure the hi hat pedals were also less responsive too. Okay. They're pieces, they're little thin pieces of metal. So, yeah. Any other questions before I play another song? Yeah. Uh, left hand traditional. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing sometimes your thumb takes over and push. Well, you have the perfect view for it. No, oh man. <laughs> Look at him. And your middle finger takes over. Yeah. And then sometimes you splay everything out. Mm -hmm. Is that, again, for comfort or just what works for you? Just works for me. Yeah. Just works for me. How about flipping from tra traditional to, to matched? Because I see you do, like. Um, that is a, that is, it used to be conscious. I had to practice the whole thing, the whole, like, that thing, which is very. physically practice that, but mentally now, I think it's just like a, I just do it, it's weird, but like mentally I think if I know I'm gonna maybe do something that's more, it feels more comfortable because it's also less of a risk of hitting here. I don't know, it's really subconscious now, but it's again a comfort thing. If I feel more comfortable hitting it this way instead of this way, because this, I never, I never liked that. I never did. Who likes going like that? Like come on, that just doesn't even look fun. No, uh, it, it doesn't look fun. It doesn't. You think that looks fun? Wait, I should go. I should. All right, should I play another one? I feel bad because I feel like I'm blowing all your ears out. I hope, I hope I'm not blowing all your ears out. All right, so. <clears throat> I have a good idea. I have a very good idea right now. So how many of you, um, you said saw my Drumeo stuff? What videos did you see? Caravan. Caravan? Everybody saw Caravan? Oops. Oopsies. Oopsies part two. Um, so all, all of you saw Caravan, huh? Hmm? Yeah, the, drum the drum battle with Brandon. Who won that one? <laughs> Who won? Clearly Brandon. Clearly Brandon. <laughs> okay. Any, any, other, any other videos? <laughs> now it's saying replace battery. Did I just break the pack? Or did I just, oh no, it's batteries. Oh, there we go. Never mind. We're all good. When you did your whiplash review, at one point oh. you said, I've never had a chair thrown at me, suggesting you have had things thrown at you. <laughs> um, well, I'll be honest with you. I haven't had a chair thrown at me, but uh, I had a drumstick stuck in the back of my back. Went shh. Oh, yeah. Legit. Yeah. I had to hold myself back from getting at that person because he's, he's a very well-known drummer as well. But I'll, I'll get my revenge one day. Not physically, but through success. <laughs> through success. Through success, I'm slowly getting my revenge because he can't avoid me. Just, you can't. I'm gonna be everywhere. I'm gonna surround you. My face will be in your, in your mailbox. That was my goal. I said, I don't need to use my hands. I'm just gonna surround you in the business. I'll just get my face all over and you can't avoid me. He went, he went, he went like that. He went, and I said, okay. 
Now I really have to be successful. <laughs> but no, I have not had a chair thrown at me, thankfully. Um, yeah, no, not yet. You, you could be the first. <laughs> so caravan, huh? Interesting. Yeah. I don't really like that song, but I'm kidding. I love that song. <laughs> it would be a shame if I played it. It would be a real shame if I did that one. I don't know.
that was fun. So any other questions? Huh? Oh, thank you. Any other? Yeah, it doesn't have to be quick, but yeah. Makes <laughs> Makes my heart sink. Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, I approached that the same way I approached all of it, which was, I said, if I start counting and I overcomplicate it, I am screwed because I can't do that. So um, who knows March of the Pigs by Nine Inch Nails? Nobody? Hmm? What was the song? March of the Pigs by Nine Inch Nails. Oh. Exactly. I have no clue what it is. I don't. I have no clue. That could be right. It could be wrong. Let's go with it. But guess what? I was not saying one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What? No. Even to learn that, I thought um ba um ba um ba da um ba um ba um ba um ba da um ba um ba. Like, because it's three repeating patterns. So when I learned that, because I had to, it was one of those songs I had to learn for a gig. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, I had, I was like terrified of that one. I was like, what is that? <laughs> so same kind of thing. That Brady song, I had that Brady Watson, the first one, for, I think it was the first one I played. That, that thing, I have no clue. That's in like five and four and it goes to three and <clears throat> good luck counting that. I have no clue. <laughs> Brady went to me, he's like, so yeah, the first four is in five. I was like, La 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 la. I like, I don't care. Now, to answer your question, actually, that I love playing or that I hate? That you love, that if, if you were to three. Down, you just three. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, like when you're just doing caravan, what typically goes through your mind when you're playing? Is it kind of like just random thoughts or are you just... Are you <laughs> all the people I hate, no, I'm kidding. Um, all the people I have to prove wrong during the solo, that's for sure. Um, I don't know, just having fun. Just having fun. No, no like, I'm going to do a polyrhythmic groove now over this ostinato, boom, boom. No, nah, nope. Having fun. That's what I think about. It's the truth. Yeah. Are you familiar with Steve Lyman? Of course, yeah. Yeah, he does some pretty crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find any application in some stuff that he does? I have actually never dug into his stuff. I know I know who he is, but I never, so I can't. Because he does some really crazy polyrhythm stuff. That, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of like, where does this, where can this be applied? But um, just kind of, no one's gonna dance to that. You know, it's like. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I guess it's everybody, wa if, if you want to do it, great. Yeah. Do I think you should have to? No. <laughs> and I think it's right for everybody? No. It's almost like the, great, the greatest equipment I just thought of, maybe it's because I just played a solo, I can actually think. Um, when we were all in school, and some of you are still in high school, there were math classes that I was like, I'm never going to learn. I'm never going to use this. Can we all like, agree on that? It's the same kind of thing. But with drums, guess what? You can make the decision to not take that course. <laughs> you can opt out of that course in drums. In high school, I really couldn't. I had to take whatever calculus, whatever that thing's called. Can I lose B? Yeah. It's a pleasure. I have to go pick my son. Thank you for coming. <laughs> awesome is there a genre you think is more, most challenging for you to learn, or was the most challenging for you to learn, like jazz, math, rock? 
you know what I mean? Like, like learn or play? Learn? Because I'll be honest with you, physically, nothing's going to beat that punk thrash. <laughs> Nothing. Physically. Physically. Oh, physically. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the first time I um, actually wanted to the Philly show, it, it's very funny because um, we were joking. I was joking with Brandon, and, uh, who was in the band previous, and uh, he was saying, he's like, dude, he's like, make sure you get Gatorade on your rider and this and that. I was like, what? And I like kind of was laughing. I was like, I like need. He's like, you need it. Sure enough, during the show, he like chugged three Gatorade. Had like an energy bar next to him because it's literally just, it's just, it's ridiculous. But it's not like some of the speed metal where, uh, sorry if I offend anybody, it's not triggered. The the exactly. So you're shaking out what? Um, a lot of the speed metal, which is a completely different thing. They'll put triggers on the bass drum and on your drums. So you can play like nice and soft and really fast, and it sounds like you know, massive. You can you could basically go like this on your bass, like really fast, flutter your bass drum, and it sounds like boom, 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 boom. No, this is old school. This is like 80s, 90s, we don't have triggers. You're actually gonna play that fast. And you can't play it. You can't play those songs like fast. You have to play like that with two bass drums, but <laughs> real. There's no, there's no cheating involved. So physically, it's, it's up there. To learn, um, probably jazz, just because there's just so much to weed through. But again, a lot of it is, do you want to take that course or not? <laughs> it's, your, it's your choice. So how long did it take you to learn that caravan? Like, was that days, weeks, months? Learn it from start, you mean, well, that's a hard question. I mean, that, what I just played? Yeah. That's just a culmination of my 16 years of playing drums. The song itself, I could learn in 10 minutes. We could all learn that song. It's a very simple form. What I just played is 16 years of playing, though. That's the thing. Because it's all improvised. I just improvised, you know? But to learn the song itself, minutes. I could teach all of you. It's not a hard song at all. The, the basic groove would take, I showed this gentleman the basic groove yesterday. I mean, it takes minutes to play the actual basic groove. Everything on top of it, you know. It's like you're getting a car, or you're getting the car with the super souped up package with all the stuff in it, or you're just buying the base model. It's like the equivalent. Anything else before we wrap it up? Yeah. So I've noticed a lot on your social media, you give like a pretty deliberate effort to engage with everybody that yeah. you can. Yeah. And I think it, like a certain point, because I'm starting to experience it myself, like you have to start to set some boundaries with people who are commenting, DMing you. Like, <laughs> I, I want to know, like, how do you go about managing that? And I believe mm. that everybody has their standard. So I guess I'm mm. wondering what your standard is. Um, well, my actual personal circle is very small. It's hard to get into that. <laughs> Um, and I, yeah, I'll engage, but there's the, the effort of three seconds of me putting a thank you or answering your DM is not letting you into my circle. People will think you're in my circle, but you're not. <laughs> but it, that's the, the reality of it, because I can't let every, you know, <laughs> there's, it's called a parasocial relationship. It's people believe that they're your friend can be scary. Meet pe people meet you and they see you every day. Biologically, if you, watch or you are watching that, you're seeing the person every day. Our brains don't know what social media is. They think they know the person. There are some weird people out there that will literally take that and think you're their friend or family member. And I'm, I've never met you. <laughs> but you know me and I don't know you and you know some people know everything about me because they creepy and so yeah it's it's weird it's weird so like when it gets weird like how do you set that boundary uh the step? block button yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or my bodyguard sure. <laughs> simple yeah anything else before we wrap it up i got let's pick a time gap between say the ages of six and 16. what kept you oh boy, what a so wonderful like question. Oh, very simple question. Oh, oh no, you don't even have, oh, I got you. Um, at, 
Oof. Bad conversation. Or boys. <laughs> Rough combo there. Uh -um. Um, no, so it's very simple. Um, at 10 years old, I was diagnosed with a disease called achalasia. I was out of school for three years, almost straight. Yeah. Almost passed away. It was extremely difficult. That man, my father, sat in a hospital room chair while I was in a hospital bed. So no, I didn't have time for anything else. I had time for drums. I had time for my family. And I was lucky to be alive. So drama didn't matter. Very simple. And one day, I was wallowing and pitting and saying, oh, I feel really sick. And if you read my story, it's, it's a very detailed story. I literally don't have time for it because it's very detailed. But um, it was extremely difficult. And he said, you're going to get your butt up and you're going to make yourself feel better. And that wasn't like a, you know, oh, I just feel better. Ha ha ha. No, it was a fact of like, I can't just sit in my own wallow in pity. I have to get up and do something. So I got up and I played with a practice pad and I practiced. And that's all I had. So once I was better and alive and living and had a, you know, I, I missed out on a big chunk of my childhood. I mean, I was like, I grew up at like 13, really, because of what I went through. So when I was really in high school and like junior high school, I mean, the, the reality I was living was a lot different than most kids. So the things that they were worrying about, I'm like, <laughs> funny. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to be rude, but it was like the, the concerns and dramas that they were talking about, I'm like, you're lucky that you were able to deal with that and not, you know, the truth of what I went through. So no, that was the best thing ever. It was honestly one of the best things that ever happened to me because I was completely alone those three, four years, whatever it was. Had my family, no friends. I had the drums, I had music, and that's all I did. Cool. So distractions weren't really an option. And that's the truth of it. Yeah. What a positive note to end on, am I right? <laughs> well, thank you everybody for coming. Huh? Thoughts are the best one for Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for coming.